Um, if, if he saw something over Hawaii, uh, recognize we flew a good long while before we got to the Texas area. Uh, and, and so it's, it's doubtful that we had something uh, in Hawaii that would cause us a thermal concern. Uh, at the time that we believe we lost the vehicle, as Milt explained, it was about Mach 18 or 18 times the speed of sound. We were at our peak heating. We were at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the wing leading edge. And uh, if we did have a structural problem or a thermal problem, you would, you would expect to get it at the peak heating, not back at Hawaii when you weren't suffering any real thermal uh, environment, extreme thermal environment. The, the most extreme thermal environment was right at Mach 18. And that's where we lost the vehicle. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Mr. Dinmore and Gesselman with Newsweek. You mentioned in your um, opening comments that, that there was indication of excessive structural heating. When did that happen in the timeline um, from 7.53 and on? And secondly, at any point between 7.53 and 8 a.m., were the folks in mission control worried? Let's see, you respond about the mission control. Let me talk about these bond line temps. We mentioned that and I might have overstated it when I said excessive heating, because as I look at the notes here, the bond line temps on the left side of the vehicle were off scale low, which means it looked like the, the rest of the measurements, it looked like they had been cut. So uh, I, pro I probably misspoke on that by saying excessive heating. It really is that we lost those measurements too. Um, the mood uh, in my area where I observe the flight control team uh, was, uh, was very upbeat and then we started to understand a little bit about these multiple loss of sensors. We recognized there was no commonality. We lost voice with the crew. We lost tracking data. We had no TV. As we came to find out later, there were, we saw the uh, TV reports of debris. We did not have that at the time. And so we were very anxious because we knew we were in an area of good communication coverage. Uh, we were in an area where we should have tracking and we had lost both. And as we uh, started adding all these up, uh, uh, we were certainly most anxious. Get this gentleman right behind you. There you go. Ron Thayer Evans from the uh, Daily Oklahoma in Oklahoma City. Um, can you confirm reports of debris in other states besides Texas, namely Oklahoma, and also offer your thoughts on Mike Anderson? I can't confirm any debris in Oklahoma, and I would doubt any debris in Oklahoma because our ground track was basically just north of Dallas on a path that uh, went through uh, northeast Texas, Nacogdoches, area from from northwest to southeast that's going to be the ground track that's going to be the the interest of our search mike anderson uh i suspect you asked me because uh, we are both from the same hometown um, mike and i uh we have a common backgrounds he uh, attended my rival high school uh, he graduated from Cheney High School. I graduated much earlier than he did, I'm sad to say, but uh, uh, from Medical Lake High School, and we were arch rivals. And he and I had a good uh, communication going about, about that. He was a, he grew up on uh, an Air Force base, Fairchild Air Force Base, Spokane, Washington. I also grew up on Spok in Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane. He went to the same grade school I did. We had a very common early beginning, but I, I told him that I, I was his pathfinder. And uh, so we had a good relationship. And we talked many times about how he had met his wife in Spokane. I also met my wife in Spokane. His parents lived there, my parents lived there, my wife's parents lived there, a lot of commonality. I'm gonna miss Mike. I'm going to miss the closeness that we had. Okay, let me reach this person right there. Sanjay Bott, Cox News Service in Palm Beach Post. We heard that earlier today that 
th this crew was very passionate about the work they were doing, the scientific experiments that they were conducting, and uh, we heard that they wouldn't, that their loss would not be in vain. What I'm wondering is the, how many of the experiments aboard, in terms of the data being collected, required that the astronauts and the craft return safely to Earth, and uh, because there were some new laboratory modules on this craft, is there anything to suggest that those could have uh, contributed at all to what we saw? Well, <clears throat> I, Ron, I don't have the answer to it. Maybe you do on the number of experiments that we uh, that we have to have the return of the heart. I don't have that. I'm sure we can get that for you. Uh, and I can't imagine a space have being on board back in the cargo bay had anything to do with this. Let me just uh, say something about the science. This vehicle on orbit, we had kind of pinched ourselves over the past 16 days. This vehicle performed flawlessly, absolutely flawlessly. Science was, uh, was a premium. The folks on the ground were just ecstatic with the amount of science that they were reaping, and they were looking forward to getting much of that information back on the ground. Certainly some of it was uh, downlinked to the ground prior to entry. Some of it was will be their legacy. Others uh, had to come back and be analyzed in which that particular part of the science would be lost. But it was an amazing mission. And uh, we were ecstatic over the results and looking forward uh, to talking to the crew and telling them what a great job they had done. And so it, it is a painful experience for us to lose our friends and, and recognize that things were going so well and turned out so badly. Valor Time Magazine, could you share with us the last words that came from the crew? Well, I, a while ago, uh, the last transmission that we got was, um, it had to do, I think I, a while ago I discussed that there was a measurement that gave an indication to the crew and an alert that they acknowledged. Uh, I, I can't tell you what they said at that time. I don't know what the word was, but it, 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 was, it was the sort of thing that, that when something like that occurs, that the crew's response is fairly typical just to let the ground know we see that. Uh, that's the, how, how the routine works. And, and uh, that was the last transmission uh, from the crew that I am aware of. And I think as we go, you know, as we go through, um, and, 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 and peel this apart, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll have more, more information like that that we can share with you. Okay, I've got time for two more questions here before I need to go to the other NASA centers. Grab this gentleman and then this young lady on the next row. Elizabeth Lee with KHWB Television. Um, a brief loss of communication, has that happened before during re-entry, and if so, when you did lose communication, was there still hope that perhaps it was just brief? And at what point did you realize that was, it was something more grave? We lose communication from time to time for uh, various reasons. We certainly lose it during the, the orbit phase. We've lost it sometimes for a whole revolution of 90 minutes. Um, on entry, though, we, we understand that any dropouts generally are brief. Uh, and if they do occur, they occur during the peak heating time frames when the plasma around the vehicle as it is uh, at its maximum extent. And so a brief uh, dropout at this time period is, is no reason for us to be concerned. Uh, our experience is we gain it back fairly quickly. Our concern at this time was that uh, as we made several calls to them, they did not respond. We made several more calls to them via UHF which is usually as reliable as anything, and they did not respond. Uh, and it became apparent to us that uh, we were in difficult circumstances. Okay, last question right there. Go ahead. When you guys first got that anomalous sort of readings where you were unclear of, you know, something strange is going on, at that point, 
was it uh, was it a situation where you guys were committed? I mean, there was nothing you could have done about it. As soon as when you first saw those readings that the the uh, you know that you things went blank or whatever, was there any was any corrective action whatsoever at that point that you could have done? Nothing that we could do. Just observe and see if there was any going to be any future downstream impact of the landing. Uh, in fact, if this if that's all we did was lose those. 12 odd sensors, no impact of this flight at all. We would have come back and repaired the sensors. They don't impact the flying qualities of the vehicle. They don't impact the insight into, uh, into how we control the vehicle. All they do is provide us information on how the systems perform so that when we turn around the vehicle for the next flight, gives us indications of where we should look. Um, did not affect and would not affect the flight given just the center by itself.